This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, it's, as you said, this is my fifth or sixth year. It's starting to feel like home. Um, it's always a pleasure. Um, I will, you'll not hear me complain about uh, leaving DC in uh, the middle of winter and coming here to this weather, to this beautiful uh, campus. Um, we're talking today about a new paradigm for Palestinian-Israeli relations. Before I move to the paradigm, let me spend a few minutes talking about the context in which the paradigm shift is happening. What is happening today on the ground among Palestinians, among Israelis, that shifts the paradigm and that defines and limits the policy options that we have at our disposal? I think the reality today is defined by two dynamics, two very negative dynamics that are mutually reinforcing. Each of these dynamics feeds the other dynamic to produce what I would call a downward spiral that we are seeing uh, today. The first dynamic is relates to the situation on the ground. You've often heard from uh, policy makers, most recently I think uh, Secretary Kerry, that the status quo is not uh, sustainable. Today we are seeing what it means. I would focus on the Palestinian side and some of the issues that are facing the Palestinian side. On the Palestinian side, what we are seeing right now is a major um, legitimacy crisis that the Palestinian Authority is facing. And this crisis is based on two uh, factors. First of all, the failure of the peace process. Repeated negotiations, repeated failed, negoti failed negotiations had basically resulted in the public, the Palestinian public, who were promised by the Palestinian Authority that uh, negotiations and diplomacy will get them independence. They have lost faith in the Palestinian leadership's ability to produce uh, results through diplomacy. Not only that, the very paradigm of a two-state solution is coming under question. The failure of, the, of diplomacy has led Palestinians to uh, believe that uh, a two-state solution might not be achievable. A couple of months ago was the first time in 20 years that public opinion polls show that 50% of the Palestinians no longer support the two-state solution. There's a quick erosion of faith in the paradigm. The second source of the crisis, so the Palestinian leadership has failed uh, to produce results via diplomacy, but also the Palestinian leadership has failed to govern. Between accusations of corruption, around 80% of the Palestinians believe that their government is corrupt, closing the political space, stifling civil society, you have the public feeling that this leadership no longer represents them. This is, this is further uh, complicated by another dynamic, a looming succession crisis. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is in his 80s. He's in his, I think, 11th year of a four-year term. Um, he has failed to deliver. 80 uh, sorry, about 65% of the Palestinians believe that he needs uh, to retire. And you're starting to see Palestinian leaders of the second tier already starting to position themselves for the uh, succession. This is creating a crisis right now. This crisis is manifesting politically, but it's also manifesting in a security way. You're all uh, familiar, of course, with the wave of stabbings that we've been seeing recently. This is many things. It can be attributed to many things. Certainly, it is a result of the lack of hope in uh, diplomacy producing results, but it's also an indication that the public no longer trusts their leaders. This is a different kind of terrorism. This is not terrorism that is being uh, driven by organizations, Hamas, Fatah, etc. These are individuals who feel that they are not accountable to a political structure and therefore take matters into their own hands. We are seeing the signs of a an erosion, a fraying of the Palestinian body politic. So the first set of dynamics is the dynamic of quickly eroding legitimacy and the crisis, political and security, that comes with that. 
Now, in the past, when we had this kind of uh, crisis, we always used to find solutions in diplomacy. This is the logic behind the Annapolis uh, negotiations that were led by President Bush and Secretary Rice. This was the logic between, uh, for Obama's uh, first effort with uh, Senator Mitchell, second effort with uh, John Kerry. The idea was always, if there's a political crisis, you resolve it by creating a political horizon through diplomacy. Well, diplomacy and negotiations today are not an available option for a number of reasons. One, and I will not spend too much time on this, is on the Israeli side. Let me just say that uh, very few believe that the current Israeli government is, how shall I say it, enthusiastic about a serious, credible uh, uh, negotiation process. But part of the problem is about the regional context. In the regional context, which is necessary for any progress, you need the Arabs to be involved in, uh, for progress. They are busy elsewhere. They have other immediate priorities. For many of them, the fallout of the Iran deal is still the most central uh, uh, concern and most immediate concern. If you look at uh, the crisis in Syria, in Yemen, this is, to a large uh, extent, a result of uh, some of the Arab countries, Saudi and the Gulf in particular, trying to limit Iran's influence in the region. Only yesterday, this crisis is spilling over into Lebanon, where because of Hezbollah taking uh, control of Lebanon, the Saudis and many of the Gulf countries are starting to withdraw their money from Lebanon. We might see a collapse in Lebanon very soon. So the region is not ready. And the US is seen by many in the region, many of the traditional allies in the region, as being in retreat, as having uh, waning influence. So these kinds of uh, diplomatic pieces that you need for a successful negotiations are not present, nor is the Palestinian domestic political situation in itself ready for uh, negotiations either. When you have a leadership that ha lacks legitimacy, it's very difficult to think of this leadership being able to make the kind of concessions that you need for a successful peace deal. When four out of five Palestinians believe that their uh, leaders are thieves, it's very hard to give them the uh, credit of making and the authority to make these kinds of uh, concessions. And again, I repeat, the Israelis and some of their behavior, settlements and whatnot, are not helping the case either. So when we talk about policy options and policy paradigms today, we have to operate within two boundaries. On one end, we know that if the status quo continues as it is and there is no progress and there is no uh, um, revival of some hope, then we are in a very steep downward trajectory. But on the other hand, we know that the tools at our disposal do not include uh, high diplomacy and do not include negotiations. And by the way, even you know, attempts recently, France, for example, has uh, suggested holding an international conference. Interesting idea. Yet even when you talk to the French themselves, they will tell you we're not quite sure why we're saying that. We're raising the alarm bell, but we do not know what this conference is meant to do and what it will produce. So diplomacy right now is almost uh, a barren uh, uh, field. So when we look at what we can do today, what are the policy options? I believe the policy options have to deal with the issue of restoring faith in the negotiations and in the possibility of negotiations. And you restore faith by dealing with the two, at least on the Palestinian side, of the two foundations of disbelief. First of all, the failure of negotiations. Now I look around the room here, around this hall. I see many of you are people who, like myself and like uh, my colleagues, we are people who were there for the uh, historic handshake on the White House lawn between Arafat and Rabin. We were there witnessing the Jordanian-Israeli uh, peace treaty. Myself, when I, uh, and, and by more kind of uh, negative or uh, pessimistic moments, I find encouragement, I find hope by knowing that I've experienced the ups and the downs. For a generation, and many Palestinians right now are a young generation, for a, genera for a generation now, the generation that's coming to age right now, they have known nothing but failure. They have not seen these things. They have seen the Intifada. They have seen violence. They have seen failures. So the first thing that we need to do is to restore the possibility of some success. Palestinians need to see things changing on the ground. Even if they are small things, they need to see that progress is possible. Now that today, luckily, and here maybe I start moving towards a more po uh, positive side of, or more optimistic side of my presentation, um, 
things can be done now because of the one success that we've been seeing throughout the last few years. The last few years, under the radar screen, not making it to the uh, headlines of the New York Times and the Washington Post, there has been a very strong and a continuously deepening Palestinian-Israeli security cooperation. Recently, there was an interview with a Palestinian security chief in which he said, over the last few months, the Palestinians have thwarted around 200 uh, terrorist attacks. Israeli security forces um, or sources reinforce or uh, support this kind of uh, assertion. So we're seeing this kind of uh, cooperation, which has meant two things. It has meant that we have right now a constituency in the Israeli system called the IDF, the Israeli military, that is willing that believes there is a partner and is willing to uh, make progress with this partner. But it also created a situation where, from a security point of view, Israel can take more measures in the West Bank that will allow the Palestinians more breathing space, more access to territory, more jurisdiction over areas that until now have been uh, off limits, more economic access to around 60% of the uh, West Bank. These are possibilities that right, right now can be done because the security situation, the security cooperation means that there is a partner on each side. Moves like this are very important. They're very important because the Palestinians need to see that Israelis are willing to move if there is cooperation, are willing to move if they feel that there's someone on the Palestinian side, but it's also important to show the Israeli public that there's someone on the Palestinian side they can trust. The narrative after the uh, Gaza withdrawal in 2005 was that there is no partner on the Palestinian side. By re-establishing the idea, there's someone on the Palestinian side that can take uh, responsibility, not in all of the West Bank, this is too ambitious right now, but at least in parts of the West Bank, can start reversing this uh, trend. So this is the first thing that you uh, need to see. Palestinians need to see changes on the ground that will affect their daily lives and that will prove that progress is possible if there is a positive dynamic. Israel will need to take certain uh, political steps regarding settlements, but I think David will address this uh, issue in more detail. But the second source of uh, disbelief that you see in the Palestinian side, besides the failure of diplomacy, is the issue of bad governance. And I believe to regain a constituency for peace, you need to rebuild the messenger for peace. If peace and the Palestinian Authority are synonymous in at least political uh, jargon of the Palestinian uh, polity, then the PA has to be uh, rehabilitated. And the PA can only be rehabilitated if we engage in an energetic, real, serious uh, reform uh, process. Many would believe that the PA is unreformable. I tend to disagree. And I don't disagree basically on theoretical grounds. But we have seen it. When George W. Bush decided that the issue of Palestinian reform is an American uh, foreign policy priority, when he managed to generate an international coalition of Europeans and Arabs and others who pushed the Palestinians toward that, we saw reform. We saw the emergence of reformers. We saw the former Prime Minister Salam Fayyad build what was uh, considered by the uh, international community and by the Palestinians as an effective, um, clean, responsive government. These steps that I'm talking about, steps on the ground and Palestinian reform, will not end the conflict. These are not the dream of peace that we have all got in, engaged with the Palestinian-Israeli issue based on. These are unattainable right now. These are not perfect measures, but the options that we have right now are not between the acceptable and the perfect. If that's the case, of course, we go for the perfect, for negotiations, for diplomacy. The options right now we have, are the, uh, or the choices, are between a trajectory that's going towards collapse, a collapse of a paradigm, a potential collapse of the Palestinian Authority, a potential political and security vacuum on the one hand, and on the other hand, small measures that will uh, not move us, uh, not end the conflict, but might move us uh, further a little bit and might uh, restart recreating uh, or start recreating a constituency for peace, a constituency that uh, believes in a two-state solution and in diplomacy on the Palestinian side. From the American point of view, the lessons that we should take is the following. I believe. This engagement is not an option. This engaging with the conflict is not an option because a collapse on the theater ultimately ends up affecting us and our uh, larger interests in the region. But also, while we should not disengage, we should not overreach either. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we have done over the last few rounds is even when times were not ripe, we actually still 
you know, having this American uh, attitude of better have tried and failed than never tried. So we tried and we failed. But failure comes with a price. And unless we are willing to be, uh, at least have a good opportunity or a good chance of success, we should not um, engage in something that will fail. Again, and I will conclude with this. What I'm suggesting is not a recipe for peace tomorrow. That's not an option, and anyone who believes it's an option is a dreamer. What I'm suggesting is small steps that might get us again to a point where we can uh, talk about peace, and measures that will uh, address a generation, a generation that's seen nothing but failure, to show them that in the right circumstances, doing the right uh, policies, maybe at that point, peace is possible. If we have that generation, we might uh, be able to restart constituting a peace constituency. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you all, and i like to echo Wraith's um, remarks. It's, it's good to come back home here again to Santa Barbara. Uh, and I want to thank Leonard and Richard and Evan and all the people who have uh, been engaged in making this possible. Um, you'll hear some convergence between the two presentations. Uh, we see things uh, fairly similarly in a certain level that Whenever it's all or nothing in the Mideast, it tends to be nothing. And the question is, is what can be done because we do see profound challenges. We think that status quo has its risk, that it could lead to a very slippery slope of, of greater violence. And the question is, if you can't implement uh, a two-state solution, uh, is, do you want to abandon it? Uh, I would argue, and I think you heard from Wraith as well, that you want to maintain the viability of the idea uh, despite all the obstacles. And I'll just, some of the obstacles Wraith said, so I won't uh, belabor them. But um, first of all, you have a very uh, objectively a difficult situation that even the great leaders, the, the, if we put things in baseball terms, the Hall of Fame Middle East leaders, names that you remember, like Rabin, like Sadat, like Hussein, and in many ways even Sharon and Begin in this regard, but things that they couldn't do. And these were people that had the love of their country and were willing to take greater risks. They deferred these toughest issues. So if the giants kind of deferred the toughest issues down the road, now you have leaders who are more risk averse, and they are now supposed to deal with the issues that the giants wouldn't even tackle. So you've kicked the can down the road on the toughest uh, issues, and now you're down the road with that can, and now you have leaders who don't have really that sense of political or moral authority the way that that previous generation did. That generation were people who all fought for their countries and therefore were so sure not what the public wants but what the public needed that they were willing to kind of run ahead. Now you have a more risk-averse set of leaders that instead of shaping the public are more reflecting it. They're reflecting its fatigue that this has been going on since uh, the Madrid conference in 91, the Oslo handshake that so electrified people, one of the iconic moments, I would argue, of the second half of the 20th century and uh, that, that both Wraith and I witnessed, or the Jordan-Israel Peace Treaty of 94. So on one hand, we've, we, we don't have the leaders we once did, but the leaders, even the great leaders, bequeath to this set of leaders very difficult issues, and they're dealing with the publics on both sides that are fatigued. They're skeptical and some rights, uh, downright cynical. And if, if Wraith and I go to campuses, it's because we're worried about a millennial generation in this country, let alone among Israelis and Palestinians, that, uh, you know, as we say, of this roller coaster ride, they, we remember the ups. Uh, this younger generation wasn't even born when the handshake took place in 1993 for some of them. And uh, to the extent they were, they have very, they have very, uh, they have no memories of it. So they can't draw upon these experiences as a reservoir of fortitude, of optimism to go forward. So on one hand, you've got a difficult leadership landscape and yet they've got the toughest issues ahead. And then you've got a regional landscape, as Wraith alluded to, that I would argue in the case of, 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 of uh, is somewhat an, an encirclement, a landscape of the, the decaying of states, 
And the fact that these states are being, from the inside, you now have non-state actors uh, that are, are more dominant. So the good news is that there hasn't been an interstate war between Israelis and, and Arabs maybe since the 73 war. But um, the bad news is that there is no, uh, these non-state actors, the, the strongest actor in Lebanon is not the Lebanese government or the, the, you know, the head of the Lebanese army, but it's Hezbollah with 150,000 rockets. So these non-state actors make the, the, the region more difficult. In Syria, the countries come apart at the seams. Um, and I don't know, like Humpty Dumpty, if we're going to be able to put this back together again to have a unitary state in Syria. Um, it's the, probably the greatest catastrophe of this generation. 300,000 killed, millions displaced, uh, a lot of refugees. Um, and so now on the border with Israel is Jubhat al-Nusra, an offshoot of al-Qaeda, not even the Syrian army. The peacekeepers were kidnapped at a certain point. Uh, and then you have ISIS, of course, over the, over the horizon there. Um, you've got Hamas in Gaza, in, in the Sinai, nominally under Egypt. You've got an ISIS affiliate and, um, called Ansar Beit Maktas, which is believed to have shot down the Russian airliner, killing 224 people. So you don't have the regional support system of states. We're going to look back like in the previous generation and say, wow, it was really quaint, wasn't it? Like people used to wear a uniform, they'd have a tank battle in the Sinai or the Golan, and then there was a winner, there was a loser. Well, the whole nature of warfare has changed because there's no front is over there. The front is over here. The front is about killing innocent men, women, and children and about hitting urban areas. That change in warfare has implications for the negotiations on what's doable. So my point is, is that you're seeing that what is surrounding that these two parties, Israelis and Palestinians, except for Jordan, which is strong and we hope remains to be strong, and Egypt, which is strong, uh, not maybe in the Sinai, but elsewhere, for the most part, you have non-state actors that have made for a very difficult regional landscape. So when we think of obstacles, we think of the problems of, of the risk averseness of the leaders. On one hand, they're also risk averse about war, too. So they're not adventurous. That's the good news. But on the other hand, they are not the leaders of the giants that I refer to. And the same is true uh, with um, the regional landscape is much harder. And also, the the, the the public dimension that Wraith alluded to is true also. A sense of public disbelief that uh, if you ask in the polls, you ask this question, do you find, do you support a two-state solution? Uh, around, hovering around 50%, it, uh, maybe a little more, they'll say, yes, I support it. Then you ask the second question, does the other side support a two-state solution? Oh, them? Hell no. Will it happen? No, of course not. So there is an, a lack of synchronization between, you know, that both sides claim that they support it, but they believe the problem is with the other side. Now, I think if you had a different leadership kind of landscape, you might be able to synchronize better, but each side, instead of shaping the opinion, as I said, they reflect it. And I think that makes things harder. And it's also, um, you know, Wraith mentioned succession. It's very hard at a time of succession politics, and I was just in Ramallah and Israel. I made three trips to Ramallah. I was in Israel for, uh, for, for a while, and I could say that that's the talk of Ramallah. Uh, Richard said, come give us the latest. Well, the latest is, as one Palestinian said, we don't have time to talk about peace right now. We're, we're busy with succession. Um, in succession, usually leaders don't want to make concessions because they think it hurts them in the succession struggle, uh, because they want to show that they're tough and compromise doesn't win votes. So that is another piece. The Israeli coalition is also a piece of this, um, where you have a coalition of 61 to 59 that looks like it hangs by a thread, but it is, uh, it is a co it's been cohesive right now so long as there's no major uh, uh, moves towards the Palestinians of this more uh, right of center coalition. So you've got a prominent, if this all wasn't enough, then you've got the round of stabbings. And here I, I think the clerical leadership, frankly, on 
needs to be step up more. Um, you know, since 1929, Palestinians have said the Jews want to destroy the mosque of Al-Aqsa. It wasn't true in 1929, it's not true today. But if you're a 15-year-old who has no memories of the Second Intifada, let alone the handshake of 93, but 2000 to 2004, 4,000 people were killed uh, altogether. So then you see something on social media and you grab a knife and you kill, and there's over 100 of these stabbings. So this has made it also, uh, and the clerics need to come up and say, this isn't acceptable. Um, and it has to be coming from credible people. But even the head of the IDF says, you know, we don't get warnings on this regard. It's not like we could say there's a cell in, in Gaza, and if we only crack that cell, we'll solve the problem. No, it's, it's now is it born out of despair for 15-year-olds, or is it born because they don't hear messages against it? I don't know. Well, I'll get to that in a moment. But all I'm saying is that there's profound challenges in the, to, to peacemaking. And look, the United States, and I was you know, very honored to be part of the last effort of Secretary of State Kerry, uh, we've had three major efforts to hit a home run ball, so to speak, and uh, go for the fences. Uh, Bill Clinton at Camp David in 2000, Condoleezza Rice with Annapolis and the subsequent Omer Abbas negotiations of 2007-8, and the effort that I was involved in 2013-14. The good news is out of the, what I call the five for five, the core conceptual bargain, I could envisage two of the five where the leaders you know, stepped up and would give more hope. I can't get into a lot of details here, but all I could say is when it came to the borders, uh, Netanyahu and the land was more forthcoming than many would believe. And when it came to the refugees, Abbas uh, gave us also a, a sense that he could be more flexible there. No one wants a single uh, refugee to live in squalor, of course. The question is, um, you know, it's not just they get to go to Palestine, which is the West Bank, which is not contested, but they also have a right to go to Israel, which is what Israel opposes. But no one wants anyone to live in squalor. So. I'd say two of the five, I could see it. The other three issues, Jerusalem, highly emotive to, for both sides, given each side's historical relations to that important city. Um, the issue of mutual recognition. Uh, do, you, um, uh, do you accept the character of the other side's state? Israel said, I don't have a problem with it. The Palestinians said, well, we have a problem with it. Uh, was it because of Hamas was leaning over their right shoulder? Were there other reasons? Can you, you know, Israel would say, okay, Palestine for the Palestinians, no problem. But you had to get the other side to say, but Israel nation state of the Jewish people, of course, with equal rights for all citizens. That we didn't get. And we tried all sorts of different formulations. The front door, the back door, the side door, the basement, the window, the chimney. Uh, we didn't want it to be said that because of America didn't think enough out of the box. And the final issue, which as I alluded to earlier, the regional issue, which was how do you do security arrangements? Once considered the easiest question, now was deemed the hardest because of the regional meltdown. And Israel saying, is Jordan, they're the people we work with to stop the infiltration of jihadis. Uh, are they gonna be around in a few years? So let me just say, um, you know, and I, you know I'll, I'll have to go into more detail in the Q&A because I don't wanna overuse my time. But I would just say the following, which is in terms of where we can go forward, it seems to me the area is maintain the viability of two states, even if we can't get there all in one leap. And that means Israel on one hand saying, look, we feel we don't build beyond the security barrier. 80% of the settlers live in about 5% of the land, closely adjacent to the old 1967 line. And the, um, the other side, uh, you, though it has 20% of the people, largely scattered all over the West Bank. If you say you're not gonna build over the barrier, that means 92% of the West Bank, you're saying is, you're not really challenging it. You're not gonna you know, put forward a, a position on sovereignty on that remaining 92%. But it would also might mean, uh, and we saw this, the Labor Party last week endorsed this, the idea of saying, but those people living on that wrong side of the barrier, maybe those people, the Knesset passes a law called uh, a compensation law, that they want to come back. This would at least signal a direction. And, but you say, but in the absence of peace, how do you convince people 
to you know, say, don't live on east of the barrier, live closer into Israel. And the whole area, it should be said, is only 50 miles wide between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. People forget that. But my point is, is that I think that each side has to take a step that signals a direction. Israel has to take a step about not building beyond the barrier and bringing those uh, and, and incentivizing those settlers to leave. And I think the Palestinians have to find ways to uh, say more people to people. We've got to find ways to get high school kids doing exchange visits, Ramallah, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Nablus. They've got to, they, the, the Palestinian approach until now is to say to do the exchange program is to normalize. That's after peace. I worry that with public disbelief being so high and public support being getting lower and lower, and we see how this shapes the leaders, that that relationship is poisonous, so we'll never get there. So we need each side to say, we're going to break through the old uh, approach of all or nothing, it's nothing. We're, uh, we're going to make sure the perfect is not the enemy of the good, and we're going to try to find ways to have an impact on the educational system, um, on the Palestinian side, and the Israeli side in terms of exchange programs to avoid the incitement that allows people to stab uh, people, even if there is no leader at the top. And uh, the Israelis will sign a direction that they're not contesting all these beyond the barrier places. They claim that they don't get any credit for not doing it, but they have to announce it because people don't know. So just to summarize, my point is there's a lot at stake. We've got to get away from nothing is agreed until everything is agreed because the result of that old paradigm is nothing is ever agreed because it's all or nothing. And we got to find the points that are converging that could signal a direction for both of these people that would give hope that even if we don't implement the two-state solution today, given that the stakes are so high for both of these people, Israel's self-interest is to have a nation state for the Jews that's democratic, and the Palestinians is not to allow Hamas to take over. Both of these peoples are on the hook uh, because if they don't lead, the people that are more rejectionists are going to take over. And this is a slippery slope to violence, I fear. So my, my hope is that there's a resilience of responsible people on both sides, and that ultimately, when it comes to both of these sides, that their will to live is greater than the rejectionist will to die. Thank you all very, very much. My question is, David, you spoke about uh, the issue of um, mutual recognition and how in the last round of discussions you tried the front door, the back door, the side door, maybe even tried the basement and the attic. Um, but could you give us some detail about what is it like to uh, try to negotiate that? And then, Wraith, um, why is it that the Palestinians continue to have such an enormous uh, problem with recognizing uh, Israel? Look, uh, look, I would just say we wanted something that made clear that ended the clash of two national movements that's gone on for a century. And that means realizing that in this small little space, there are two national movements. There's a Palestinian national movement, and there's been a Zionist national movement, which is that you know, one place where if the Jews are persecuted uh, as, a, as a homeland, a haven, they have a place to go. And um, what, was, what was upsetting for me, and I don't know, Wraith agrees the same way, but I felt with, uh, with Abbas that was, whether it was because Hamas was looking over his right shoulder and he didn't want to be seen as conceding that point, you know, I, you know, I, I, I we, we, I said to him, this was even before, well, I was, before I was in government, I just said, if you're saying that, uh, you know, that this is, a, this is the more Israel wants this, the more I can get for it tactically, I think there's a way to signal that, that you feel you've got a great card to play. But if it comes across that you don't think, otherwise it's going to come across as saying the Jews don't have a right to a state anywhere and not in the 67 lines, not in the 48 lines. And 
you know, I said, there'll be people, you know, and I had a discussion with someone, I, I can't say his name, but someone very senior on the Palestinian side, I said, look, I don't think the Jews are a people. Uh, they're a religion. And if you can't bring yourself to that, to me, the historic irony of Golda Meir, when she said there's no such thing as a Palestinian people in the 70s, I thought the Palestinians were right in saying, who are you to tell us we're not a people if we're not Jewish and we're not Israelis? So, um, you know, then uh, who are you? And now it seems that it's like been flipped around, that Israel doesn't have a problem to say Palestinians <coughs> have a right to a state. Um, but you have to recognize that each side will define for itself. That's what self-determination is, if there are people or not. And so that was, um, I found, one of the most um, you know, sobering moments. And it was another reason that made me feel that the core conceptual bargain of five for five, um, of these five core issues, um, you know, that I don't think it's worth trying to do the five for five right now. Let's just do what we can do uh, and uh, avoid the, the slide downwards. You know, I mean, if you were to ask, I mean, first of all, actually, just a quite, uh, point of clarification. The Palestinians did recognize Israel in the uh, exchange of letters between Arafat and Rabin um, as a result of the Oslo Agreement. The Palestinians did recognize Israel as a state. The question is, do you recognize Israel as a Jewish state? Now, if you ask Abbas, he will tell you, he will give you two reasons slash excuses why he's not doing it. He will tell you, I will not be a party to uh, something that will re reach this, uh, re result in discrimination against Israeli citizens who are not Jews, or 20% of Israel are Arab citizens. And he will tell you that if I accept this, then I'm uh, complicit in their in discrimination against them. The second reason he will give you is that if I accept this right now, it will be tantamount to uh, uh, giving up on the right of return in advance. Um, I think, personally, these two concerns are maybe legitimate, but can be easily dealt with uh, through drafting uh, skits. So that's not the real reason. The real reason, in my view, is what you mentioned, David. The minute the Israelis put it on the table, and this is the nature of negotiations, you put something on the table, you really need it, great. How much are you willing to pay for it? So Abbas saw that the Israelis wanted very much, and he said, okay, I will uh, be hardline on this until I get a good concession over that. Now, this is a sound negotiating tactic. The problem with that is not with the negotiating tactic. The problem is of the reflection of this in public opinion. Because negotiations do not happen in a hermetically sealed environment. The Israelis raised it. The Palestinians responded publicly. They said, we will never accept it. And you started seeing a shift in Palestinian public opinion. Interestingly, if you look at public opinion polls, from around 1994, when they started polling, until around 2012, the Palestinians had no problem with recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, the Palestinian public. It started to shift in 2012. And 2012 happens to uh, coincide uh, with the date when the issue was first raised by the Israelis. It was Tsipi Livni, actually, not uh, Netanyahu, who first uh, raised it. The Palestinians said no. They made a big deal out of it. And we started seeing public opinion shifting. The voice of the leaders who were saying we will never accept Israel as a Jewish state, they were saying it for tactical negotiation reasons, the public took it at face value. And the public opinion started shifting. So what happens now is even if Abbas wants to uh, use it to concede on it uh, at the end game to get a price for it, he has created, he has become a hostage of his own rhetoric. He has mobilized public opinion in a way that becomes so hardline that making that concession has become very difficult for him. Now, personally, I'm, I am against raising any issue of identity into in, in negotiations. I think these are not, um, uh, they do not lend themselves to negotiations. Yet, what I learned from this experience is be very careful when you raise an issue and be very careful how you respond to an issue. Because by a certain response, you might create a reality and a public perception that makes it difficult for you to make the concession when you need to make the concession. Can I, can I just uh, respond, Richard, very sure. quickly? On the Look, I, I hope you're right in a certain way that it's only tactical uh, for Abbas. But, but you said but he's created like the snowball effect that he can't stop anymore and that what he started as tactical might be more than tactical. Um, you know, that's one way to look at it. And uh, if you're right, then maybe that suggests that because the, the language was there. It was about, like I said, n nation state. Jewish people with equal rights for all citizens, whether they're Jewish or not. So that was an important point. I think the issue became an issue 
when you know people say, well, it was never raised in the Egypt-Israel negotiations. You never asked the Egyptians to agree. You never asked the Jordanians to agree. And that is true. The problem was, was that the Israeli and Palestinians, it's the heart of this conflict, where they're contesting each other's land. I mean, the Egyptians never contested Tel Aviv, or the Jordanians never did either. Um, this is the heart of the conflict, and what, what, it, what it really, I think with, and then Arafat said, well, there was never a Temple Mount, and there was a, maybe something in Yemen or Nablus, and um, I think you gotta be careful when you question people's history, uh, historical narratives. As, as I've learned from you, Raith, uh, and I, I, I say it myself now, you know, people's historical narratives maybe do not come from a place of, of malice, but at a certain point, you have to accept that what is holy to them, just like you wouldn't say Jerusalem, oh, this is the holiest site for the Jews, it's only the third holiest site for the Islam. It's crazy, I mean, you, you have to respect people's own identification, and it just seems to me that if you question people, the character of the other society, you are denigrating the very recognition that you want to achieve. So whatever the tactical reasons, um, I think that this is, this is a mistake, and because, as you said correctly, the, the, the negotiating room is not hermetically sealed, and the public thing has a life of its own. You know, we, I have a handful, no, I mean a lot, of very, very good questions and comments. So I'd like to begin with this, and this is directed to you, uh, Wraith. You make a powerful case about the corruption and dysfunctionality of the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinians' lack of trust in it. Which organizations or institutions do uh, have the support and respect of today's Palestinians? Well, it's, it's a bit complicated. I mean, on the one hand, the Palestinian Authority and the PLO, while still being seen by, me, while seen by Palestinians, as I mentioned, as corrupt and uh, ineffective and inefficient, there's still a core belief that they do represent, at least they are the institutional framework in which the Palestinians uh, operate. So they still have at least that uh, title and a general recognition. But that is right now eroding. It's eroding, but it's not being replaced by anything else. Interestingly, if you look at uh, the Palestinians, you ask them, do you trust the PA and Fatah? They'll tell you no. You ask them, do you trust Hamas? They also tell you no. Because Hamas, in the way that they ruled uh, Gaza, were a disaster. A disaster in terms of bringing three wars uh, for no reason, disaster because they were corrupt and as corrupt as everyone else. So what you're seeing is uh, while the shell of uh, the PA and the PLO remains there, there is no belief in it, but the belief uh, is not going anywhere else. You're starting to see fragmentation. And again, I said that the wave of stabbing right now is worrying from a Palestinian point of view. It's worrying in many ways, not least of which uh, I believe using uh, terrorism and violence is corrosive to a society. But it's also worrying because it shows that uh, the public decides that there is no institutional framework, no political framework with which they can, uh, you know, that, that has the authority to tell them when to use violence and when not to use violence. They believe right now, I am an authority in, uh, into myself and everyone is an authority into themselves. This is not how you build a nation. A nation that loses its political uh, structures is a nation that will disintegrate. And I fear that what we're seeing right now is reminiscent of what we saw in the 1930s, where you had a lousy Palestinian leadership, it lost the faith of the people, it made major political uh, mistakes, including the Mufti meeting with Hitler. What do we end up with? We end up with the Palestinians losing a generation in which the Palestinians were no longer uh, masters of their own destiny. And I fear that if we do not revive the hope that peace is possible, and if we do not revive faith in Palestinian political institutions, we might see a Palestinian generation that is lost and that is bound to make the exact same mistake that the old generation made uh, until the, the, they reconstitute themselves. Um, several of the questions um, deal with leadership that both of you spoke of. And if I could summarize these questions, uh, it would be probably something like the, the, the following. As you look at both of these communities, both of you pointed to the importance of leadership. You use the, the term Hall of Fame leaders. We don't have that. Yeah. Um, uh, Wraith took, uh, talked about the de delegitimation of the Palestinian Authority. So as you look at the situation, are there people coming up who might be cultivated um, as potential leaders in the future? 
I mean, uh, let me start maybe with a caveat and then uh, get to that. The caveat is, uh, generally speaking, leaders emerge when you least expect them. Sadat, who now we look at as the most probably significant figure in uh, modern Middle East history, he was chosen to the post of vice president and then became president because he was seen by Nasser as the dimmest, weakest, least threatening of all of the uh, generation that created the... Uh, and guess what? He became actually the most courageous one of that whole uh, generation. So with that in mind, basically someone we might not expect might be the leader. I would say it would be a mistake to sit and wait for the knight in shining armor because the, he or she might never come. I think what we can do is create the kind of environment that would uh, cultivate someone like this. And I look at the Palestinian uh, example, I look at uh, former Prime Minister Salam Fayyad. For those of you who haven't heard of Salam Fayyad, he was a Prime Minister who came on an agenda of reform and did a tremendous job in reforming the Palestinian security and governance structures. Now Salam, he was not someone that landed from Mars. Salam Fayyad was a member of the Palestinian system, in the financial system, he was a banker in the IMF and in the Palestinian system. But he managed to emerge when we, from the United States, started insisting on Palestinian reform. You turn reform into a priority, reformers will emerge. You turn into a peace, into a priority, peacemakers will emerge. So I think rather than sitting and waiting for fate to throw us someone, we can have policies that will encourage certain trends and discourage certain trends. And we do this not only by you know, giving a speech, and not only by taking a unilateral American position, we do it by exercising our diplomacy, by building coalitions, by getting the Europeans on board, by getting the Arabs on board. We can do it, we can be transformative without having to do state building in the uh, Iraq sense, but by creating incentives in, for each society to produce the right kind of, uh, of leaders. I would, if I could, on the, look, I'd like to, on one hand, echo what, um, Great said about Salam Fayyad. He is, I think, a world-class visionary. He's about an ethos of accountability. Uh, if Arafat was about an ethos of entitlement, his view was, we build institutions. It's what we do for ourselves that matters. He would tell me stories about how he would even read Zionist history at night. And uh, what they've done from 1917 to 1947. Uh, he said, by the time Israel declared the state, it had already built it. It had already had universities, hospitals, um, the Jewish agency, proto-government, the Haganah defense, uh, a lot of the sick fund, the trade unions. Now, the Palestinians have institutions too, but his view was they were weak and they needed to be strengthened. And I kind of think that we have not heard the end of Salam Fayyad. I would, you know, maybe even if one of these future things you'll ask me about him. I don't know if he'll emerge as the president. I don't think he has the base on the Palestinian side within the Fatah party. He doesn't come out of there. He has a PhD from the University of Texas in economics. He worked at the IMF. But the Europeans have demanded the financial accountability in the end of the Arafat era, and that's where he emerged from. So it's interesting. He's a guy that might not be president, but I could see him come back as prime minister. There are different factions. I am worried on the Palestinian side that the division between Hamas and Gaza and Abbas in the West Bank that they don't have elections because each one's afraid the other one's going to win. And that is a mechanism of legitimacy that is missing. Uh, the parliament is closed. Um, and so I wonder if the, the, all these different factions that are not based on ideology, they're based more on personality, I think, and uh, power politics. I wonder if the net effect is some sort of compromise candidate uh, that is not with either of them, but a more collectivist leadership because there is no mechanism of legitimacy of an election that will emerge like Abbas had. He had, a, of course, the history of being number two to Arafat, you know, immediately after Arafat's death. So I think succession is a murkier thing, but I do think Fayyad will be in that mix, maybe not as president, but possibly again as prime minister, which is more technocratic, but he's a guy who actually did the reform agenda, as Wraith said. On the Israeli side, what has happened is, I think the people that have had more of an impact, and I don't want this misinterpreted uh, by people in this audience, but who have shaped Israeli politics in a way, has been Hamas. I mean, they have, by the fear of terrorism, when people are afraid, they go for people who emphasize fear more than hope, and who says, I will defend you. 
and that is a natural impulse. I think that Netanyahu is abhorrent, obviously, as Hamas is to him. There's no question it is. But the, the predominance of fear, I think, has led Israel in a certain direction. He's turned out to be a very uh, you know, successful politician. He's in his fourth term. If you measure politics by survival, he's a, he's a survivor, and he feels that defending his country is defending it against Hamas, defending it against Iran, and I understand that. Now, will there be certain people that maybe will emerge out of the IDF, like Rabin and Barak were generals of the IDF, uh, Agabi Ashkenazi, who was a former chief of staff, Ag uh, uh, Benny Gantz, the, the last chief of staff, could they emerge? Maybe. Uh, we'll see. On the other hand, the Israeli public is also of the view that unlike the Rabin era, they want their government to like walk, chew gum, and do a lot, 10 other things. So will a security guy have that kind of uh, versatility, agility? That remains to be seen. Or will they somehow embed themselves in the leadership of the Labor Party or the Lapid Party, which has been more focused on uh, trying to uh, force the ultra-Orthodox into the workplace. I don't know. But I do think that they will be part of the mix. And I just want to underscore what, uh, what Wraith said, which is we shouldn't wait for the guy in, in shining white armor. We should do what we can do. And if, when that person comes along, whether it's a he or a she, whoever it is, great. But we cannot, again, wait for the perfect and be paralyzed until we get the perfect. Um, I have one more question um, that I'd like to pose. And this question is drawn from multiple questions that you've written or comments. And I'm going to read two of these. And there, it, the question is outside actors, the role of outside actors. So one very uh, interesting question in that is, what do you think the Catholic Church, especially Pope Francis, thinks of all of this? In other words, thinks of all this, I think the person is asking, you know, does the, does, the, uh, does the pope have a role as an outside uh, actor? And then listen to this one. Don't answer yet, OK? Um, and I think probably all of us are thinking this one. How do you think the next president selected will impact the situation, good or bad? Right? A lot of us are thinking that one. <laughs> so what is the role of outside actors on the one, one hand, the President of the United States or the United States, and then international figures of extraordinary power like Pope Francis. OK, let me start with the book. Uh, <laughs> anyone with moral authority, a voice with moral authority that actually reinforces the need for peace, the need for both parties to accept the legitimacy of the others is an important voice. The question is, what is the limit of the, uh, the role of uh, particular re religious leaders? Do we want religious leaders like Pope Francis and uh, others to get involved beyond giving a supportive environment? And my own point of view of this is no. And maybe we disagree on this one, but uh, I believe that this issue should remain the domain of politics. This is the kind of uh, process diplomacy is best uh, dealt with by political leaders, diplomatic experts, and whatnot. Bring too many religious uh, uh, figures into it, and you might shift the nature of the conflict. And I've actually, frankly, been in enough meetings between Palestinian or Muslim uh, leaders and Jewish leaders to realize that uh, quickly they realize the only thing they agree on is that uh, gay people should not uh, march in Jerusalem and uh, women should stay in the kitchen. So uh, sometimes you bring some of these religious uh, leaders, you bring them with, yes, they have a moral voice and moral authority, but they sometimes come with a value set that might be antithetical to what we want. So the question is, how do you create this, uh, use them as a supportive environment, but not give them too much voice uh, in a way that would distort the nature of the uh, conversation? With the U.S., it's a very different story. First of all, I think nothing can be done in this conflict without U.S. leadership. U.S. leadership vis-a-vis -vis the parties, the fact that Israel, that the U.S. is the only country that Israel trusts, will have tremendous value in giving Israel a sense of security when making the difficult decisions uh, and compromises, compromises in a peace deal. The fact that the U.S. has unique uh, um, 
assets, and by assets, I don't know only mean uh, fighter jets and uh, money, but ability, diplomatic ability to create coalitions, to uh, bring our allies in the region and in, in Europe and elsewhere to be part of this, is something unique and this indispensable. And if there's no le US leadership, there'll be no uh, peace. Now, I am personally, on this issue in particular, um, I'm not that worried about who's going to be the next president. Because I see this as an issue that is of significance to U.S. national security interests. Now, the significance goes up and down based on many factors, but it's always significant. And I remember when George W. Bush first became president, I went to, uh, I was still a Palestinian official at that point, I went to the National Security Council, met with the guy who was in charge of the region, and who told me, point blank, that president will never touch this. Bill Clinton left him a letter saying, if you want to be burned, touch this issue, I advise you not to deal with it. Guess what? Bush ends up being the first American president to accept the two-state solution as an official American policy. And it's not because, again, Bush woke up and saw the light, but because there was a set of national security considerations that ultimately led him there that way. So I'm not worried about who the next president is going to be when it comes to this issue. I am more concerned and I have a more sense of priority that the next president should re-establish U.S. leadership in the region and beyond. Because without the U.S. leadership, without Israel trusting the U.S., without the Arabs trusting the U.S., it would be very hard for us to create the kind of architecture that we need to reach a peace deal. Yeah, I, I completely, oh yeah, I completely agree. Um, it matters who sits in that chair uh, as, as president of the United States. I'm not here to endorse any candidate, so I don't want to go down that road. But U.S. leadership is, is everything. And all the regional actors recalculate their interests if they feel the U.S. is with them or not. Um, and um, I can tell you, as someone who served in the U.S. government, it, it, it was, you know, I, I do feel there were a lot of, you know, the, the Israelis will say that we've never had as good of a military intel security relationship as we had today. Um, and now the two parties are actually discussing a memorandum of understanding. But at the same time, it would obviously be not, um, you know, t t saying the full truth if you said, but the friction over time, uh, if they don't have that core rapport, that is going to spill over because people take their cues from the top. And I saw, I saw this really firsthand about how it really matters who sits in that chair. So, um, but it's about, it's beyond, it's the U.S.-Israel peace, the U.S.-Palestinian peace, but it's about how the, the players in that region view, is America going to be a player in, in, in the Middle East writ large? So all these points we agree on. Uh, on, the, on the Pope, I would say, um, I would use the word supplement but not substitute. I mean, in terms of the role of religious leaders, look, they've already had a prayer meeting. I think uh, Pope Francis, I don't know, Shimon Peres, and, uh, and Abbas. It was nice, uh, but I don't see it, it was decisive in any way. But I do think religious leaders, writ large, should be, uh, when I say a supplement, not a substitute, you're not going to substitute for the diplomats. We don't want a political conflict between Israelis and Palestinians to morph into uh, a Jewish-Muslim uh, dispute that's based on religion because a, a dispute uh, on, that's political is solvable. A dispute based on religion is not solvable. So, I, but I do think they could play a role that's positive, especially when we get to the issue of Jerusalem. We're going to need these clerics to, to, to supplement and being a voice for coexistence. And I would argue, like I said in my remarks, we need them to tell 15-year-olds not to uh, take uh, butcher knives uh, and stab people. So I do, when I, I, I take the question about the pope as a more of a metaphor of the role of religious leaders writ large. And so I do think they could play a role not instead of the diplomats, but alongside them on a few key issues. Jerusalem and violence are two examples for me that we need to hear more of these kind of voices for coexistence. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to put more questions of yours and comments together for our distinguished guests. But at this point, I think uh, we have to thank you. And of course, you're always, always welcome back in Santa Barbara. And we will do everything we can to have this discussion again 
in February or March of next year. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all, Richard. Thank you all. Thank you.